Hello and welcome to this episode of Music with Tony Toppy. Today's focus will be analysis and the focus will be melody. This is part five in the series of analysis for DCE music performance. As always mentioned, this is why it's important that we do analysis. Um, of course, you can go back to my previous videos to understand these points a bit more clearly. But the main point, it's always to help us improve our own performance skills. And we're always looking to understand the expressive outcome. Why are the performers doing what they do in order to achieve a certain level of expression? So let's get straight into it. The topic of today is melody. What is melody? Well, it's the main tune. What you're most likely to hear or it stays in your head after you've heard a work or song. It's not an expressive element, meaning that it is fixed. The composer has written a melody and the performer will present that melody. But the performer can put expression into the melody in various ways. And of course, always to achieve an expressive outcome. So here are some things to talk about when listening for melody. The contour, which is basically the shape of the melody. And in, in an exam situation, you can draw very you know, broadly how that would look. And we've got some examples there. What's an impulsive, iterative, sustained, ascending, descending, stationary, varying. The list goes on. You can choose whatever you like. And you can graphically represent that in a written situation to help you. So basically, the shape of the melody. We have the tonality. And that's basically the key that the melody is centred around. So is it major, minor, blues, pentatonic, chromatic, for example? So the tonality. Then we have the intervals within the melody, and we can describe the type of intervals used. Are they stepwise? Are they leaps? Are they you know, major seconds, minor thirds, etc., etc.? You can be as specific as you want, and you can be as descriptive as you want. The range of the melody, basically the highest and lowest points. What's the distance? If you can hear the distance in an interval way, you know, is it the, is it a range of an octave? Is it a range of a perfect fifth? Is it a range of a major tenth, for example? Then you can use that, but you can certainly um, be more descriptive in that response as well. That brings us on to a register. Register is where the particular melody will sit within the broad confines of a particular instrument. So where the melody sits in relation to the instrument, we can have a low register, middle, or a high. And it's important to remember that a high register, for example, in a bassoon, might actually be a low register for a flute, for example. So it's not w sort of a one-size-fits-all. It depends on the instrument. Phrasing. We spoke about this way back in another episode. And that is all about how we play the melody, how we express it. So it's we, but we can also talk about length of phrases and, of course, how the performer shapes the phrases with regards to articulation, with regards to dynamics, with regards to tone colour, etc. Et so I tell you to look back. I think it's episode one or part one of the analysis series. Word painting. This one really only applies to any music with lyrics. It does not work with lyric um, with songs without or works without lyrics because it's, it's inherent in the name, word painting. And it's basically when the melody imitates the lyrics. If the word is high, then the note or the melody will ascend. If the word is low, the melody will possibly descend. And then we can talk about the climax of the melody, which is basically the high point, not necessarily in pitch. A high point could be where the pitch goes to its lowest, for example. But yes, that's sort of, I suppose, the highest dramatic point of a phrase or overall a melody. So there's seven um, topics that we can use to talk about melody. So contour, tonality, intervals, range, register, phrasing, word painting, and climax. Let's get straight into it piece of music and it's this piece here every valley from messiah by um handel from the baroque era it's a great piece of music we'll have a listen through i've got the text there on the left hand side and then on the second hearing we'll i'll um, outline a bit more about what's happening in it here we go performed by kurt Strait. 
with the English concert and directed by Trevor Pinnock. And this recording can be found on YouTube. And it's a great one because it actually introduces us. I think that Trevor Pinnock is actually talking about the music and how um, it came to be and the meaning behind the text. I haven't included, included it here, but it's a great review to go and have a look at. Okay, let's have a listen. There has never been a changed message as big as this one. piece of music there, one of um, Handel's most p um, famous works and it's certainly got a great sense of melody and word painting and, and um, excitement to it and it's exactly what it's meant to be. It's about a, a song about change and a song about, you know, there is a change coming and that the you know people on the bottom will be made high and the people on high will be made low and sort of everything sort of evens out. Um, I've got a picture there of a mountain and valley just to sort of help illustrate perhaps what Handel was trying to recreate in his music here. So let's talk about what we've got here. The contour. That's just my little interpretation of the general contour. Each phrase sort of has an ascending and a descending section to it, which I think is basically him or Handel that is trying to create a picture in our minds of the mountains. And then of course the valleys, which are the bits in between the mountains. If you think that first phrase, every valley shall be exalted. So up and then down. The word painting is 
rife in this particular song. The word exalted, meaning to raise up, gets higher each time it's sung. The word low gets sung low. Crooked is generally sort of going between two notes. Crooked, da dum da dum, and then straight is generally a single tone, straight, and sung quite straightly with no vibrato. I could go on to look at literally every single word, but um, we would be here for hours. But of course, word painting and then cross reference to the contour as well. How he's made the contour shaped like a bit of a mountain there. The tonality very major. It's um, in fact it's E major, which in the Baroque times was um, gave a good sense of triumph and was quite a strong key. So it's fitting that this particular piece is in a major tonality in E major to give us this sense of strength and triumphantness that um, that I suppose the Messiah is coming to free us all from sin, etc. The range, um, it's a. Um, I looked at the score, it's actually a major tenth. It goes from a low E, as in E on the first line of the treble staff, up to G sharp above the staff. Um, if you could hear that, great. But I think we would all agree that it's definitely over an octave range in this particular piece. And that's quite a large range for a song, especially um, for a singer. And one would think that maybe he's once again his handle is trying to show us the grandeur or the greatness of a mountain and how large it can be intervals i think mostly we can hear ascending steps every valley moving up in seconds um and then we've got descending leaps it generally goes up by steps and descends in leaps so if you think if you're walking up a mountain it's probably a bit slower getting up the mountain than it would be to get down. It's quicker to go down. We fall a bit faster than we climb. So maybe he's trying to show a bit of that um, expression there as well. Who knows? Register. I think this is sort of in the middle to high tenor register for the Baroque times. It doesn't go up to anything crazy like a top C, which we heard more probably in the Romantic era's late classical era. But definitely we're looking sort of mid to high register for the tenor singer. And that'll have sort of tone colour implications as well phrasing we hear that he crescendos as the phrase ascends we have balanced phrases meaning it's generally you know, groups of twos or fours like the phrases balance out we don't have phrases of three and then one and and different numbers there this is an interesting word here melisma the use of melisma which is one syllable many notes exo etc i can't do it nearly as well as um, mr street can but you get the idea. His use of melisma, how, how is that used? Is it smooth? Is it staccato? Is it attacked? Etc. And he's got a varying use of tone colour, especially when he sings the word rough and the rough places plain. He gives it a bit of grit there. So, we're going to have another listen to it, and I've got the score running through this particular time. I want you to have a look and watch the music and see if you can see these sort of ascending, descending lines and everything I've just spoken about, word painting and see if you can pick out how he does his phrasing. Here we go. There has never been a change message as big as this one.
So I hope you um, found some interesting moments there. Um, I've certainly found there, just right on the end of the um, music here, the crooked straight, a little um, improvisation here on this A sharp, and same with here at the end, very common in Baroque to add some ornamentations and improvisations towards the end of a work or at a cadence point. So I hope you enjoyed that little um, talk on melody. If you have any questions, queries or comments, please feel free to contact me at tonytoppy at me.com. Come.